shall we cheers cheers buddy yeah so we're drinking some uh pizza rat pilsner <laughs> shout out to pizza rat um we figured with this d- topic we should definitely be drinking some beer i mean it's yep. only it's only right to be drinking beer while talking about idleness exactly i and i it's, when we first had the idea for this i thought maybe we could have a, a shots of coffee and and beer that we could oh, take yeah. you know depending on if we felt like we're swayed in the, uh, against uh, stevenson or, or pro Pro-productivity but productivity versus yeah uh slothly slothliness <laughs> <Exactly. I don't laughs> yeah it's cool i'm actually reading a book called history of the world in six glasses oh really? and this author does like he breaks down like the world history into six different sections it's like the first section is like beer and talks about kind of like the beginning of civilization then it's like wine then like spirits and then coffee which is like in the um enlightenment yep. and then i think it's like tea and then coke anyways that's a bit of a rant but uh I, yeah. I still attribute most of the enlightenment to coffee. No, but sure. that's, I think that's why I brought up, that's the point he makes yeah. is like that coffee was like this, yeah, stimulus and like all about productivity and like the coffee house sprung up and well, so, gauged all this like intellectual conversation. Then we should at some point make sure to circle back to that <laughs> and, and talk about, maybe at the end we can talk about our uh, opinions on coffee and it's... Uh, impact on productivity versus idleness and I like the, it. the direction it pushes the world and the same with alcohol so i'm into it sweet so you cool. got to say it till the end to, all right to yes, hear that exactly part. tease bit of a teaser <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> all right so we are doing this essay an apology for idlers by robert louis stevenson as most people know author of treasure island dr jekyll and mr hyde but also wrote some nonfiction. and this piece was Super cool. It's actually been sitting on my shelf for like two years now because I heard a quote from it that like resonated with me and I wanted to read it, but like I didn't quite know who I wanted to do it with on the podcast. And then you and I were like chatting about productivity and stuff and it kind of organically happened. I was like, what if we did this piece about, um, you know, Lewis's arguments for uh, like why productivity isn't all that. Yeah, and I was pumped that it was like eight pages long. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty short. So maybe he wrote it for idlers. Yeah, it's just like idlers aren't going to want to read a long ass essay. Or he would kept he was just got tired of writing and it's like all right, <laughs> yeah. I, that's a good spot to end it. Yeah, exactly. Well, cool. Let's uh, let's dive in. So he actually starts this piece um, by a quote. And actually, according to the footnotes, it's a bit of a misquote, but it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll stick with what, what Stevenson wrote. So it's this um, interaction between this two, these two men. The first man, Boswell, says, he makes the argument. He says, quote, we grow weary when idle. And then his friend Johnson replies, quote, that, sir, is because others being busy, we want company. But if we were idle, there would be no growing weary. We should all entertain one another. So that's kind of the argument he starts off with. Like if, you know, the only reason we're growing weary is because uh, essentially like we don't have anybody to play with. Maybe that's a simplified way of saying it, but like, or I guess another way of saying it is like everybody else is off working in that, um, you know, maybe we feel some kind of guilt like we should be working. Yeah, I, I think there's a few pieces that I agree for sure. It's like there's an element of social uh, kind of unity that you mm. want to feel that you're not off doing something different, right? Because I feel like any time you are doing something different from the rest of the world as you see it, mm. you start to wonder why that's the case. And others yeah. do too, right? Yeah. And it's interesting, we're here in the capital of productivity Productivity universe, you know, New York city. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel that the other element to me is that in a more practical way, you want company, right? Mm. So, so by doing things, by being productive here, right. Yeah. Where that's kind of the, the whole idea of living here is doing things Mm. and producing and being productive and being kind of high, high uh high intensity living basically Mm, yeah um 
you will meet more people practically by be engaging in all those circles and by going out and doing stuff. If you aren't here, what opportunities are you going to be in good company? Basically, yeah. Right? If if you're an idler and you're it's a Wednesday at twelve uh twelve noon, yeah. W- who are you going to interact with? Right. You, you more literally are <laughs> yeah. have no company. Yeah. No, I, I totally, I agree with a lot of that. And I've recently have a job where my like weekend, like my two days off are like a Monday and a Tuesday. And it's really hard for me to kind of relax on those days. I think even though it's like, oh, I've already put in my five days of work and like I should treat myself like re- relax or something. It just feels weird to like watch an episode of Seinfeld on like a Monday at noon because I'm just like, everybody I know is working. Yeah. So just psychologically knowing that everybody else is working, I think can have a bit of the effect. So the argument he's making, well, if everybody else was idle, then we won't grow weary. We'd all entertain one another. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. So, and we'll, we'll kind of flesh out that idea more, I'm sure as we go in, because that's... Um, I think it, the reason he puts it up front is cause it kind of, uh, foreshadows a lot of this stuff yep. you'll get into later. I think we should break down every two lines <laughs> yeah. in that much detail. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. Um, all right. The next kind of thing he does is he defines his terms. So he, he states pretty clearly what he means by idleness. So on the first page he says, quote, idleness does not consist in doing nothing, but in doing a great deal not recognized in the dogmatic formularies of the ruling class. Um, so that's, I guess, a good thing to keep in mind during this whole discussion is he's not really talking about just like literally like sitting on a chair and just not doing anything. It just idleness for him is any activity that... I guess society deems as idleness and he would, I think, argue they deem it as idleness because it, uh, you know, is not monetarily valuable or is not productive in the sense that it, um, you know, it, it is not, tra- it is not traditionally a value, at least like in a capitalist society. Sure. Um, and he gets into later, some of the things he's talking about are like, you know, enjoying the sound of a stream or like listening to birds or like relaxing or enjoying a meal. Like these are the kind of things that I think fall under idleness. And he is kind of making the argument. These aren't, these aren't nothing. These aren't doing nothing. It's just not, uh, quote, recognized in the dogmatic formularies of the ruling class. Yep. Yeah. So going into this, I kind of expected to have some disagreements with mm. him, right? Because I'm very much always focused on productivity and how I can optimize everything I'm doing, mm. figuring out activities that are dual purpose, right? That fulfill a social function and also uh, uh, it's a learning function, right? So yeah. Stuff like that. But once he said that line, I realized, oh, then... I just, I probably am going to agree with most of the stuff he Mm. says because I don't, I personally feel like I've always rejected that the traditional kind of societal judgments Mm. on what is a productive task or not. Ah, Okay. So for example, when I was prepping for this and reading through this and making notes, I counted that as my productive time. Right mm. to me, that was productive. It's something I was learning, something I was like actively using my brain in, and you know, it was time I wasn't watching Ninety Day Fiance. So <laughs> I thought felt yeah. that was productive. Yeah. So I literally have it in my schedule during my blocked out as mm. a certain color in my schedule because I think it's valuable, and I have the same for, for example, exercise or going on walks or anything that I feel is a productive or healthy let me let me rephrase that a, a positive impact on my life mm. or somebody else's life yeah so it's much more kind of categorizing by um maybe pushing forward progress mm. type goals in some realm 
much more so than, well, I should do this because I'm society says so or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of reframing productivity as well of like, well, something like people watching maybe isn't normally thought of as being productive, but Steven Sid would say it's a very worthwhile task. And he kind of talks about that later about like, just like going into the world and observing. Um, and I guess if you are somebody like Stevenson, who was a writer, um, like people watching is extremely important because yeah. that's a lot of what artists are doing is like observing the world, writing down what they see and, you know, um, but yeah, again, like, to a lot of an onlooker, you know, maybe somebody on Wall Street might just see this like <laughs> hippie sitting in a cafe, like watching people and like, sure. you know, they What's, would say, oh, he's, he's being idle. He's not doing anything, yeah. but there's something that's going on. It's just uh, a different kind of something. And, and I feel like there's a little bit more cultural acceptance of that, at mm. least in our generation, or maybe it's not our generation, but in people under 30 mm. throughout time. Right. Yeah. Throughout history. Right. You think back to different eras like I've, the 60s. Right. They had a different idea. The young people of what was worth doing mm. right to them, you know, having their hippie experiences meant a lot. Right. And it was something important, whereas to the old people, it wasn't. Yeah. So I wonder if that's just kind of a, a you know, difference of opinion throughout history as you get older. In fact, I, I want to talk about this, but. I think one of the the negatives that comes with growing older along with kind of the opposite end of wisdom mm. is seeing and judging experience through your experience, right? Uh yeah. So if you so when I'm 50, maybe I'll look at my kids and think, why aren't you reading more Stevenson? Right. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, or why aren't you going on walks? You know, cause yeah. that's my version of it. And I've basically reinforced to myself over my life mm. that that was important. So then I'm trying to give advice and give that to somebody else. But in reality that they have a, a totally different life and experience and different things that resonate with their brain and help them to learn. Yeah. So what, what's the point of me trying to make sure they're doing the things that I did. Totally. No, and I, 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 can, I can relate to that. The example I think of is like, I recently hiked part of the Appalachian Trail and a lot of people that were my age were like, oh, that's awesome. Like, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> and I told my grandma and she just like didn't get it. And I was on the trail and like, I was telling her about it. And she said like, she was like, oh, you didn't have anything better to do? Like, because <laughs> in her mind, it was like, you know, she's, lived through part of the great depression it was just yeah. like you know you work um so yeah i think it's generational and the other thing uh stevenson actually tells a little story here let me see if i can find it about a kind of intergeneral intergen intergenerational conversation between an old man and a little boy i love uh, that part <laughs> yeah let's see if i can find all right so so the story I'm not going to read the whole story, but it's basically a a boy is, you know, during school hours, he is like laying by a creek and just kind of like, you know, hands behind his head, just like laying back, just kicking it, just enjoying it. And this old man comes over and chastises him, like, basically, like, what are you doing? Like, you should be in school. You're, you're being lazy. Okay, boomer. <laughs> yeah. And the kid says, okay, boomer. No, the kid <laughs> says, <laughs> the kid says, quote, I lie here by this water uh, to learn by root of heart a lesson which my master teaches me called peace and contentment. So it's very interesting the, the way the kid is framing this because he's saying that like he, basically he is practicing a skill, that skill being like I'm practicing to learn how to be content. Um, and again, like I don't, at least personally, that's usually not a thing that we think of, of like, oh, I'm, I'm working on learning how to relax, but the way he's framing it is kind of like relaxation itself is a bit of a skill. Yeah. And like, that's what I'm doing. Like I'm, I'm learning this skill called contentment. And it's clear kind of what, what, uh, 
camp I'm in because when I read that part, I was like, man, good for you, dude. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, bec- and it's because in the end, we live thinking of cause and effect, mm. right? So the old man that approaches him and chastises him for doing that is thinking of cause and effect, yeah. but he hasn't updated it for other people in mm. other ways of being, right? From him, he is legitimately thinking, well, if, if, and if then statement, if you just sit there and lie there, you will be a burden on society. Mm. I'm going to have to pay for you because you can't, you yeah. aren't doing anything. You're just going to not learn any important things. Your mm. life is going to continue to be uh, unproductive or, and so on. So right. he is thinking like that, but he's closed to all of the potential reasons that that could be useful. Mm. And, and for me classified as a productive thing. Yeah. Right. So, and, and Stevenson gets into this later on, but being a happier, more fulfilled person who's mm. practiced contentment yeah. is going to have a more positive impact on the people around them. Right? Yeah. Not showing up every day as an asshole is a good thing. Mm. And part of the way to do that is by learning to be happy with your life or content or in a state where you are calming your mind or wh- whatever it is, whatever method this boy was using to relax and just co- you know, cultivate a positive mindset, basically, that that is more good. It's It's possible that that's more good just by being a positive force on society and mm. even local society, just the people around them and being a positive, supportive person yeah. has more impact than do, going the traditional route. Yeah, and, and that's a big, a big point, and we can kind of get into that now. So, sure. So Stevenson has this idea that basically we have a moral duty to be happy. And um, he says, quote, there is no duty we so much underrate as the duty of being happy. And then he goes on, by being happy, we sow anonymous benefits upon the world which remain unknown even to ourselves or when they are disclosed, surprise nobody so much as the benefactor. And this, this idea really stuck out to me because I know for me personally, when I think of like, somebody pursuing their own happiness, a lot of times it can kind of take on like a egotistical kind of selfish motivation of like, oh, he's just trying to be happy. But the way Stevenson thinks about it is like, your being happy benefits other people in all of these ways. And um, I was thinking of a few things. I was thinking of one, like, I know for like my parents, like for them, there's probably nothing I can do for them. Like there's no nicer thing I can do for them rather other than to be, be happy. Like my being happy is probably the nicest thing I can do for them. Um, but it's at least for me, it kind of goes against my intuition, Yeah. but it's just like, what would make my mom happier than like for me to be happy in my life? That's a, that's a really good insight. Cause I think, a lot of people often get caught up in the how, right? Like, mm. and a lot of the advice parents, for example, give is the on the how of being mm. happy. But I think it can get lost in translation that the goal is for their kid to be happy, yeah. Right, and 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 I think there can be so much conflict mm. in that journey too, right? Just with bad communication, where uh, the kid just wants the parents to be proud of them. And mm. the parents just want the kid to be happy and right. safe, right? But and if it was reduced to just those terms without all the baggage in the middle, it would be so much a better relationship. And they have different, um, they have they imagine different ways of getting there. Mm-hmm. So like, even with the old man story, I don't know whether the old man had the kid's best intention in mind. He could have just been a bitter old man, but he could have also wanted what's best for the kid and just thought that like, well, you are going to like 
end up being miserable if you don't go to school. So yeah. it could be that like the old man actually wanted the kid to be happy. It's just that like the means by which to get there, they differed on. Yeah. And, and to be fair, the most likely situation is it was a little bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, the other thing he says on that point about, um, you know, being happy, he, he talks also about like, let's see. So yeah, this is another quote. He says, quote, if a person cannot be happy without remaining idle, idle, he should remain. Um, and then he says, it is better to be a beggared out of hand by a scrape grace nephew than daily hag ridden by a peevish uncle. I had to look up like six of those words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So some of the, some of the terminology is a little dated, but in layman's terms, what he's saying there, it's better to be happy and poor or happy and a beggar than it is to be miserable and industrious. And he kind of talks about this character, um, like a kind of hypothetical character who basically is like Ebenezer Scrooge. Like that's the <laughs> archetype I thought of. Yeah. It's basically like this curmudgeon who is extremely industrious, you know, hard, hard working at their job, but just like miserable to be around and just brings everybody down around them. And he says like, he says in so many words, I think he actually says this point blank, like the people in that person's life would be better if he was dead. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> brutal, he, pre, Stevenson, pre, pretty brutal. brutal, but he's making that point that like, um, you know, in terms of like how you are affecting society, sure. You are being productive in your, your job or your career, but, um, <laughs> you're just so it's such a buzzkill essentially yeah. yeah i agree and and i think the the one of the the crux of a lot of this is that there is ex there are extreme individual differences between mm. people yeah. one person may fit very well into the traditional societal um productivity model and be fairly content and be happy mm. whereas somebody else that might be one of the worst possible worlds yeah and to act like they both have the same duty or obligation to behave in that way makes no sense because mm. if that leads the one person person b to be absolutely miserable it's pretty you could pretty quickly figure out that they would be uh imp impact the world in a better way if they were just happy and just, they just stopped doing everything and were sure. just happy and maybe that's not the case for person a maybe mm. person a um, feel, feels a little bit better when they're just chilling, but is cool with working. Right. Yeah. And so they are, if their job is productive and, or adds value to people around them in the world, mm. maybe that's a good fit. But the, the, the thing is that it differs so much from person to person. And, mm. and that's kind of what I was talking about as people kind of harden and crystallize as they get older, they start having less, um, I don't, I don't know, less acceptance of individual mm. difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it probably does it. You know, he's not saying we should be idle. He's saying if that's the only way to make yourself happy, that's better than the alternative. But I think, and this goes with a lot of the stuff in this piece is like doing work that you enjoy or that you love, or that makes you feel alive, like can also work for all of these arguments and that like, you know, uh, your happiness can spring out of helping others. So this isn't like, he's not arguing just to be like selfish and, and happy and just lazy. He's just saying like your, your happiness ultimately is going to have positive effects on other people. And, um, yeah, I think this is, I think it's true. I mean, I think, I think we tend to be more generous and, uh, altruistic as well when we are like somewhat content or somewhat yeah. happy we're not kind of um yeah we're kind of coming from more of a place of abundance and and it's that idea of that's i don't know it's probably been throughout all of history but that happiness uh like exudes from a person and mm. is contagious yeah right and the same thing with uh really negative mindset right yeah it just you it's experientially true 
mm. right? You can go and be with somebody that is just always full of life and just helps the people around them feel better. That's that's very different than thinking of the most uh, down, like yeah. negative person you know. And, and again, these are these are general terms. I'm not saying um, ha- happiness is. I'm not saying like if a, like a depressed person or something. I'm I'm just mm. talking about somebody who is basically choosing to live a life that is bad for them, and then being mad at everyone else because they are doing that. Mm. Right. So it's 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 not so much the person's disposition as it is their almost like grievance at society for having to do what they do and then having it come back out. Right. Mm. So I think when, when you're idle, you don't have an opportunity to go through that thought pattern because you're not, no one is imposing their will on you, right? Society Mm. isn't forcing you to do anything. So you're free to just interact with people without that, um, kind of haze of just the, the idea that your life is controlled or forced to be a way that you don't wish it to be. Yeah. Which, kind of leads into um so we were kind of talking about how this story he tells about the old man and the the young boy the old man might have wanted what was best for the kid but he also might have just been like you know why should you get to like lay by this river why i have to go off to my job and stevenson talks a little bit about this like resentment that those who you know, partake in the workforce feel towards those who are either idlers or, you know, thought to be idlers. Um, So he says, quote, it is admitted that the presence of people who refuse to enter in the great handicap race for six penny pieces is at once an insult and in and a disenchantment for those who do. And then he goes on while such Uh, While such a one is plowing distressfully up the road, it is not hard to understand his resentment when he perceives cool persons in the meadow by the wayside, lying with a handkerchief over his ears and a glass at their elbow. So he's basically saying like, you know, some guy who's going to a job that he hates when he sees somebody who's just like laying by a stream with like a, a, you know, bottle of beer (laughs) He's kind of feeling all this scorn, just like, well, why, you know, this isn't fair. Like, why should I have to go to this job while you just lay here and, uh, and enjoy yourself? Yeah. That's, I, I've been noticing over the past few years how much that feeling of injustice governs human behavior, mm. right? Whether that's, it, it's probably the strongest when one's applying it to themselves. Mm. Um, but, that feeling of fairness and that if I'm suffering and you don't have to, that's not fair. Right. Right. And I like even I think it's kindergartners they mm. showed have very strong feelings about injustice. Yeah. Like if one class member is given six cookies and the rest are one, they will be very indignant about that. Well, they'll even throw back their one cookie. Yeah. Like it gets to the point where it's irrational. Right. Because it's like, it's better to have one cookie than none, but out of sp- like spite yeah. and like, they'll be like, well, fuck you. Like, I'm not even going to eat my one because he had six. Yeah. It, yeah. So, so that's so strong. Uh, and it really seems to win out over other emotions. Mm. So, and it unfortunately it seems to be out empathy most of the time yeah and more and uh, again um like i i see that happening a lot of the time yeah well it's I, I think it's just it's it's getting to the root of like injustice of like why why should you get to well and he's also kind of making the point that like a lot of times the person who is working this job they hate is working this job they hate in order to relax So when they see somebody who's already doing it now, it's kind of like maybe, you know, there's a bit of a resentment and it maybe also throws off a little bit of their like, man, maybe I have my priorities wrong. And uh, Stevenson mentions this quote by, um, by uh, about Alexander the Great and Diogenes. 
And so this is a story, it might be apocryphal, like it might not have actually happened, but it has said to have happened where Alexander the Great visited the uh, cynic philosopher Diogenes in Greece. And at this point, Alexander the Great was like a young man. I think he had already achieved quite a bit, but he was still still a young man. And Diogenes was this old philosopher who at that point had kind of renounced all of his material possessions and was living homeless in the street. I think he was living in a barrel. <laughs> like that was his that was his thing. And he was just like this really like wily character. So anyway, so Alexander the Great, this like, you know, this great conqueror comes in to visit Diogenes in his and Diogenes is laying in the sun, like not doing anything. And Alexander says, what can I do for you? And Diogenes says, you can get out of my son. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of condescending. <laughs> but the, the quote that Alexander says, which is the one that's in this piece, is if I weren't Alexander, I would be Diogenes. And I think there's a few ways to interpret that. So one way to interpret that would be, um, you know, if I weren't this kind of ambitious conqueror, like I would be like homeless. But another thing is him kind of saying it with a bit of admiration, which is, I think, the way that uh, Stevenson is reading it, which is like basically him saying like, man, I'm out here trying to like pillage and conquer like the entire world in order to get to the state where I can just lay in the sun and do nothing. And here's this guy who's homeless, who is doing that. And so there's a bit of like admiration of just like, man, uh, maybe, maybe I'm going about it all wrong. I feel like they're kind of two sides of the same coin Mm. because I feel like Alexander and Diogenes are both counterculture in a way, right? Mm. What Alexander did was by no means the average thing most people did, right? (laughs) Well, maybe, I mean, you could say somebody who's just like working to bust their ass on Wall Street, get to the top, climb, climb the ladder, like they're essentially... You know, I'm not saying this is the only reason that sure. these people are motivated by it, but a lot of times, like, like there's the movie Wall Street where Charlie Sheen is like, maybe if I just hustle and hustle and hustle on Wall Street, by the time I'm 30, I can retire and like go to some beach and right now I think he says and like go to China and ride my motorcycle around. <laughs> and the point there is like, he, like, why, like you could do it now, right? Um. Or like the line in Office Space where he's like, what would you do if you had a million dollars? And he's like, oh, I would sit around and not do nothing. And the guy's like, you don't need a million dollars to do that. My, my cousin don't got a job and he already does that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, there's probably a lot to say yeah. about the whole like Alexander thing. But I mean, yeah, it's it's. I think I would agree most people... I'm not going to say most people necessarily have the ability, but many more people have the ability than think they have the ability to do Mm. that. So I I think people's notions of what they need are not necessarily accurate when assessed Mm. through the lens of, I mean, that's the thing. I feel like a lot of people who are operating in a way to basically take advantage of the way society works to be rewarded in a way with with uh, means by which you don't have to work and you can do nothing. Yeah, I feel like you're you're thinking about the system from within the system, mm. and there's certain kind of axioms you take for you take as like true. Like I need to have X because of retirement or I need to have this or that because um, I need to have a house that has X number of bedrooms Mm. so that when my kids come to visit, they have a a room or any of these suppositions that further necessitate working longer 
or right. having more before you do that. Right. Basically, uh, what I'm talking about is all the factors that make our retirement age like in your 60s mm. in general. Some people work longer, some people not as long. But the if you altered what people felt was enough, that could totally shift that timeline. Totally. Well, yeah, it's questioning because it's, it's somebody who has a belief that like, before I do X, I need to do Y. Right. So Alexander has a bit of like, before I can lay in the sun and do nothing, I have to conquer the known world. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, and I think Stephen is since having us question that of like, that thing that you are wanting to do someday, like, can you do it now? Yeah. Um, do you feel the, that the you- answer is not, I don't think the answer is always yes, but um, I think sometimes the answer is it's a lot more attainable. There's actually a book um, by Rolf Potts called Vagabonding. And it's all about like traveling the, traveling the world on a really low budget. And he actually uses the the scene that I mentioned from uh, wall street with Charlie Sheen, where Charlie Sheen's like, maybe if I bust my ass, like on wall street, by the time I'm 30, I can ride my motorcycle to through China. And he actually like did the math and was like, you could actually, if you were smart and saved and like just didn't buy shit that you didn't need, you could on a janitor's salary save up enough money to do that in half of a half a year. So that's something where like Charlie Sheen has just this like false belief that like I need to be the you know top broker on Wall Street in order to like get this thing that I want. Where I think Ralph Potts is saying like it's actually a lot more attainable than you think it is. Yeah, it, it that's that's really interesting because I I feel like I see that all the time with people wanting to retire, but like oh I can't yet, mm. and and having other potential lifestyles or options available. A- again, if they don't mind working that much, right? Maybe that's the best equation. But I think most people are are operating on narratives mm. of what they're supposed to do and kind of the the path rather than the numbers. Right, yeah. like the data, and and kind of with more modern ways of assessing these things, it, why don't you calculate, um, you know, the average like yields of a certain certain type of investments and plan stuff out? And a lot of people do that now, mm. right? So there's a whole movement of the like fire, you know, like mm. uh, retiring early, yeah, and it's just based on saving, uh, like data and organizing your spending and prioritizing make tons of spreadsheets and just figuring it all out like not what's the narrative what's the reality yeah so i think getting away from some of these cultural narratives can help us to actually assess well the assessing is a different part but actually come up with a plan mm. to figure out again this is a different part figuring out what society what you actually need but we have ways now to have a plan to get based on what you have, your skill set, all this type of things mm. to a place where you don't necessarily have to worry and you could operate in this way. Because I, I do think there's part of an argument here that I do feel like is slightly um, optimistic. Yeah. Right. Like the kind of, uh, like when he phrases it, somebody who is miserable working would be, do better to just be happy and not right. do anything. Right. I, I feel like there is some level of, you do need to eat though. You do need to eat. You yeah. do need, you know, basic needs. You could be in debt. Yeah. I mean, right. there's a lot of, yeah. So there's lots of ways of doing that would, that would probably put you back feeling bad again. Mm-hmm. Right. Being, worrying about when your next meal is, you know, living a life of scarcity. That's not, yeah. I don't think that's what he's advocating for. Right. Yeah. And he doesn't, I mean, yeah, that's a good point. Like he doesn't get into too much of like, uh, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the counter arguments to this piece would be exactly what you said was just like, well, I got to eat. I've got six kids, you know, I've got debt. Like I've got he actually does talk about uh, student loans, which, or call it like student loans, which I guess were a problem even back in his day. Is that like a lot of, you know, people will go into debt 
uh, paying for their education and then start their career in debt. So like, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. Um, one other maybe facet of that, um, okay. Yeah. So one other facet of that, so we're talking a little bit about some of that resentment that maybe like the working feels for the person who is idle. There's another aspect that we didn't really mention where he has this idea that like, I'm just going to read this quote and then we can kind of unpack it. So he says, quote, it is a sore thing to have labored along and scaled the arduous hilltops. And when it is all done, find humanity indifferent to your achievements. Hence, physicists condemn the unphysical. Financiers have only a superficial toleration for those who know little of stocks. Literary persons despise the unlettered and people of all pursuits combine to disparage those who have none. So he kind of, he doesn't say this explicitly, but he's saying there that like we have a need for recognition or appreciation for our work. And a lot of times people will, you know, bust their ass at something and then find that like the public or the general population just like doesn't give a shit or isn't recognizing them. And that can build some of that resentment. Um, the idea I thought of, um, I went to school for music and there were a lot of, um, like, like jazz musicians who would spend insane amount of times perfecting this craft. I mean, you know, putting in their like 10,000 plus hours learning like jazz trombone or something like this. And it's a very, uh, niche skill set that probably less than 1% of the population can actually appreciate or that actually cares about or could actually tell that person who is like a virtuoso jazz trombonist from your like typical, like, I don't know, like, okay, jazz trombonist. Yep. And I think at least what I noticed is a lot of kind of resentment build up, builds up in certain, those certain individuals. Where it's like, if you mention somebody like Kenny G into like a jazz musician who has spent their life perfecting a craft. Um, they will just spit this like, I mean, Kenny G sucks. Like, don't get me wrong, but, <laughs> but it's kind of like in, in exuberant amount of like, uh, scorn and resentment. And I think a lot of that comes from like, here's this guy who's like, I don't know, maybe only spent, 2000 hours perfecting his craft and like, isn't really that good. And is sure. playing to stadiums here. I am like having spent all of my, you know, 10,000 hours learning this and like, nobody gives a shit. I think, I think that's kind of what he's hitting on. There is this like lack of, uh, appreciation from everyone else. And that I went to music school too. And I also saw that. And I feel like that's the most common in fields that are somewhat dying mm. or waning in their uh, social importance. Their popularity. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Because you've now trained for something that is not in demand it, to yeah. the extent. And there's too many people that now are highly skilled and it basically is directly invalidating, right? Yeah. Because it's basically the market saying, oh yeah, whatever. We just, the few people who listen to this genre actually want to hear Kenny G. Yeah. You know, so you, yeah, we are whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and so much, and I, I feel this too, is so much of, so many artists kind of, not even just artists, people, anybody when it comes to their work, externalize their own value into mm. the work. So it's almost a representation of their intrinsic value as a person. Uh, and yeah. that very much, I think, comes from our type of society where, it, I mean, technically, the, our economic value is what we produce, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's how we 
the numbers are put together. Like, what is your economic value, basically? Right. And that's what you're paid, and that's what society rewards you for. So, basically, in our assist, first of all, our economic system is telling that jazz trombonist, oh, your economic value is like, I don't know, $100 a gig. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we don't care that much. It's not that important. And also, uh, beyond just the, the, the economic value socially, mm. nobody can even tell. Yeah. Right. There's not even an acknowledgement that you're any different than the kid who just got into college for it. Yeah. Right. That, that last set 8,000 hours didn't really mean anything to anybody. To, yeah. To so, most of the population. And, and I think this actually translates to almost everyone who, like, like the old man who's trying to give advice to the, the kid laying by a stream. Mm. You need to come up with a reason that you wasted your life. Mm. You, it, and you need to find some way to reject that that is what is true. So if you wanted to be, let me use myself, for example, right? Yeah. I've spent thousands of hours learning to write music, orchestrate, mm. all these things. If there's not enough, uh, jobs mm. right for that let's say the job market went to zero yeah i'd probably uh, my mind would want to justify it still somehow that i spent that time doing that mm. and not not accept oh well i guess i wasted the last eight years of yeah. my work life right it doesn't want to accept that so it has to find something to latch on to to tell you you didn't waste it it's them yeah, which is kind of going back also to like the Alexander thing. Like Alexander had to kind of question that and be like, well, shit, like maybe I've been going about it all wrong. Like I've just spent, you know, the last <laughs> couple of years uh, <laughs> conquering the world. Like I could have been uh, chilling like my friend Diogenes. Down the street in yeah. a different barrel, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Maybe we can jump a little bit. Um, he talks a lot about how when we are young, we should spend a adequate amount of time in idleness. So let's see. He says, quote, people should be a good deal idle in their youth. And then he says, I really like this. He says, many things become impossible by the time a man has used spectacles and cannot walk with a stick. So he's responding here to um, a popular um, position at the time, which is basically we should spend all of our time when we're young studying and reading books and like, you know, he he's saying like, well, shit, by the time you're older and, you know, have worked for this free time, there's a lot of stuff you're not going to be able to do. Like you might have bad knees, you might not... Uh, um, and he's saying like, we can, we can read in old age, but we can't, I don't know, hike the Pyrenees or, or like whatever. Um, and there's like a lot of things that, uh, are only available in our kind of golden years. So I think that's one of the arguments that he's making. Yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. I think I always think that it's best to approach those things with balance Mm. Right. Didn't he say something too about what was it like? It's basically his argument is that it's reduced to the simplest version. It's better for young people to just experience life than yeah. to be just focused on learning from a book. Yeah. And that there's something that's different about the experience of learning or just experiencing life than there is about sitting and learning through others. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I, I definitely agree in terms of, I feel like the life experience is what gets you interested in learning more. Mm. Right. So I think they go hand in hand and this is always one of my 
arguments with kind of the way education is set up is that they just expect you to be interested in these topics that are presented to you without experiencing them and seeing if you have interest in them. Mm. So it, it seems universal that if somebody's interested in something, they're going to learn it more effectively. Yeah. Right. Most interest or the, the strongest interest I think comes from experience, right? Discovering something on your own, mm. um, you know, learning, like seeing somebody do something that you thought was impossible, right? And, and then trying to figure out how did that happen? Mm. That is, you're going to absorb probably, I'm not kidding, probably like 80% more at least, if not double what you would just being presented with it because you have a framework and you understand its importance. And let's see if this makes sense here, but I, I've always thought that emotions and experience are the things that tell us what is important. Yeah. And data and institutions and stuff are help to gather large sets of data to better understand things on like a worldwide level. Hmm. Yeah, the, no, I think that's an interesting idea. So it's like the the actually experiential part kind of is the thing that motivates you to actually want to do the science or do the kind of more bookish end of things, which yeah. is, I think, maybe it's probably a strategy used in a lot of schools, which is like why you go on a field trip. Yeah, It's just like, oh, well, we've done this thing and it's very like hands-on and now – now, when I'm lecturing about, I don't know, agriculture, whatever is <laughs> happening in the, in the, we've gone to the farm, they've actually seen it, and that's kind of sparked the motivation. Yep. He, the, he also says, um, so he doesn't deny that, like, more formalized ways of learning are beneficial. He says, quote, though I will, though I would not willingly part with such scraps of science, I do not set the same store by them as by certain other odds and ends that I came by in the open streets while I was playing truant. So he's saying like, I'm grateful. F yeah. This is the modern version of that. He's saying, I'm grateful for all the things that I learned in school, but I wouldn't trade them for all the things that I learned in the streets while I was playing hooky. Yeah. And this kind of goes back to like, uh, the people watching and he's, he's very big on like, I guess what I would call like experiential learning, experiential understanding versus just, uh, versus just an intellectual understanding. And there's this other quote. This is actually the quote that I heard that made me want to read this piece. He says, quote, books are good enough in their own way, but they are a mighty bloodless substitute for life. Um, and that that hit me hard because um, I'm somebody who reads a lot and maybe at times uses books as a means of escape. Hmm. Um, but I think what he's saying there is like, I mean, exactly exactly what he's saying. Like we we can spend all this time even reading a great novel. I mean, great novels are great. You know, we, we read Dostoevsky. It's, it's, it's amazing, but actually living and, you know, like being a part of your own myth of your own story is so much richer. And I don't know, I see a lot of this both in society and in myself, this kind of maybe like escapism into even something like reality television, which is like, let's watch these other people live their life mm -hmm. or, you know, let's escape. I just going to escape into all of these fantasy novels rather than going on my own journey or, you know, yeah. And I, I don't, I, one, one other thing, just real quick. I, I noticed, um, like I said, I recently hiked part of the Appalachian trail and I took a book with me and I didn't touch it the whole time. <laughs> And I think part of that was I was probably just like exhausted physically, but another part was like whatever was in this book was just much less interesting than what I was experiencing. It was just like, you know, why am I going to bury my head in a book when I have like a bear outside of my tent right now? Like, <laughs> so I think 
I think he's kind of getting into that aspect of like, books are great. Don't get me wrong, but like, life is really the the thing that we should have our eye on. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And one of the things that I thought of when I read that passage that I'd never really thought of before was all books are somewhat false because they're filtered through the lens of someone else. Mm. And they are inherently not um, the rea- truth for you because they are from somebody else's experiences, filtered through their mind, judged what was important about it, and then presented in a hopefully concise way. Yeah. yeah. But there's no reason to think that that's a substitute. Like reading somebody's book on hiking the Appalachian Trail, they have selected, first of all, they had different experiences. And second of all, they have a totally different idea to them what was important. And Mm. if they're telling you the story and telling you what was important about it, that's not the same thing you're going to get out of it. Yeah. And, And I think that's going back to the idea of individual variation. It's so important to have a society, in my opinion, where everybody does have a slightly different take on things and is not just accepting one cultural narrative Mm. about this or that, right? Yeah. So video games are a waste of time, for example, right? Mm. Well, maybe that's, for some people, the most meaningful social experiences they have. Yeah. So there's no reason that, and and maybe for somebody else, it gives them anxiety. I don't know. Yeah. So... There's so many different things that these, these uh, going back to the idea of narratives, like that we're operating on in the, um, you know, TV is a result of a bunch of different um, creators, mm. like presenting a vision of something, uh, books, every piece of media we consume is like a pre-digested yeah. experience, right? And then rehashed and presented to you. That's not saying it doesn't have meaning, because in some ways they've created something totally new, but it is something different from the experience it's based on. Right. It's already filtered through one person or one, uh, somebody else's mind. It's not, it's not, you're not tapping into the source. You're right. tapping into like another person's version of the source. And, and, and that ex- life is, I think what he's saying, life is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate, you know, first hand ex- first person experience is ultimate i think is the point that he's making yeah yeah absolutely the other thing i was going to bring up on that point um you know another uh maybe of of stevenson stevenson's um arguments against reading <laughs> which is really funny actually coming from like such a famous author that he he spends all his time kind of attacking books Um, but he says, let's see, he says, quote, if a man reads hard, as the old anecdote reminds us, he will have little time for thought. Um, this is another one of those quotes that just hit me like a ton (laughs) of bricks, which is like, man, there's a lot there. Like if we are constantly consuming, if we are constantly reading, listening to podcasts, watching the TV, talking to other people, you know, if every moment of our lives is just full of chewing on other people's ideas, we have very little time for our own ideas or for our own critical thinking in that, like, yeah, we need to carve some time out to, like he says, like lay by the lay by the water and just kind of let our mind wander. And in doing that, it's again, it's not idleness. It's not doing nothing. It's like you might be uh, thinking up a new business plan or a new novel um like those those moments of and science backs this up as well i mean we talk about like the diffuse mindset versus the um i forget the more uh focused mindset but like diffuse mind is is where your mind is essentially wandering Mm -hmm. and you are forming a lot of these connections from different parts of your brain and that's where a lot of our insights and creativity comes in so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I like that quote a lot. I'd, I'd like to hear what you thought of it as well. Yeah, no. Uh, can you reread it again? 
Yeah, so he says, if a man reads hard, as the old anecdote reminds us, he will have little time for thought. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I definitely, I, I see what he's saying, right? If you're constantly consuming other people's thoughts, are you leaving time or even valuing your own, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, I have this whole idea of trying, and this actually goes into kind of part of my whole productivity journey, right? Which is trying to balance input and output Mm. and not having too much of one and understanding when I need more of the other. Mm. So output being, um, you know, writing my own thoughts, creating music, experimenting, trying new things, journaling, basically putting things out um, to myself or to the world that is it kind of, the the filtered stuff Mm. and also knowing when I start, when that starts to slow down, I need more new stuff coming in, Mm. right? Whether that's reading a book or going on a walk or talking to a new person, whatever it is, I need something new to help add to the, uh, like many things swirling around in my head because I've kind of processed a lot of that stuff, but I feel that I'm, being the most effective at both of those and just being a more interested, mm. activated person when those are balanced, right? And and, and I'm not yeah. just focused on one because I, I just, I feel like there's high level of diminishing returns mm. when you're focused on one. Yeah. Well, and I, 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 I relate to that a lot. And I think the reason this quote hit me like a ton of bricks is I tend to if I'm not, if I just kind of let everything go without having a discipline or structure is I just tend to consume, consume, consume. And, um, so yeah, I kind of have to consciously focus, focus on like, okay, I need to kind of like (laughs) read a little bit less and write a little bit more or, Mm -hmm. you know, like the words you use, like output a little bit more input, a little bit less. Sure. I actually have the opposite tendency to where I am making too much stuff and i'm like i really need to learn something new mm. right because i i'm just rehashing similar things uh, yeah and because i i enjoy that process and then i'll like using like uh, orchestration as an example mm. i'm busy trying out these techniques and doing it and getting it better and better and better and then it's been three months and i'm like i haven't really learned anything about mm. new stuff yeah and and i'm always my kind of i'm because I lacked it so much when I was younger, I'm always trying to est- establish the like f- most solid of foundations. Mm. So I'm always rehashing like fundamentals and I'm always like working at those basics because I, you know, I'd play guitar really fast and it was so sloppy or I'd write music that was really complicated, but just didn't make musical sense or w- mm. whatever it is. I'm, tr- I'm trying to get back to the basics of what works. And I underestimate the speed at which time is moving and the, you know, uh, basically just the, the limited time I have. So I need to speed things up by getting new input. And that also spurs output because yeah. it, it gets you new ideas, make you excited about, oh, I could do that and apply it to this. So it's it's just efficient. And I think it's a better way and a more, uh, a better way of, for me of being. And it also gives a little bit more freedom to follow what I want to do in the moment. Mm. So let's say I'm just starting to work and I just feel like the kind of feeling Stevenson describes as like the guy showing up to work and just miserable and like, Oh, I can't believe I have to do this. Maybe I just don't do any that day. And Mm. I just start decide to just watch a bunch of videos about getting better at it. (laughs) You know, again, I don't think I, I don't think you can necessarily just totally follow your emotions on the day, but I notice for me, it goes back and forth. And some days mm. I don't want to listen to something. I just want to go get stuff done. So knowing that that's a natural rhythm for me, it's actually helpful for to just allow me to do what I want, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I like, I like what you said too, about kind of listening to 
listening to yourself of like what you're wanting to do in that moment. And obviously, obviously it's not always practical. Sometimes sure. it's like, well, I want to stay home and stay in my warm bed, but I have to go to work. But it's like he Stevenson makes the point that all work and no play is soul crushing. Like yeah. eventually, and he says, quote, uh, as if a man's soul were not too small to begin with, they have dwarfed and narrow theirs by a life of all work and no play. So he is kind of creating, again, this kind of maybe caricature of a person who has basically become a zombie. Yep. And I've unfortunately met a few people um, who kind of – I've seen this in a few people that I, I know who have just – worked jobs they hate for so long that they just kind of get that eyes glazed over look you try to talk to them and it's just like this monotone like non-responsive uh yeah it's just like at a certain point like they've just been beaten down it's just like soul crushing and it's you know i feel empathy for 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 them and i think steve steven's antidote is like well look you've you've constantly I don't know. I'm kind of maybe use psychoanalytic terms. Like you've constantly like smothered your inner child to the point where like you haven't allowed yourself play in years, or I guess another way of saying that you haven't allowed yourself to do what you want to do for years. And like, it's gotten to the point where like you've just smothered your inner child and it's just gotten become numb. Um, yeah. So, I think that's some of also why he's preaching of just like sometimes your kind of inner child wants to just like, you know, hang out by the water and like listen to the birds and smoke a pipe. Um, and again, that by doing that, it's not not doing anything. It's like it's good for the soul. Yeah. Um, and I can speak personally. I know for like for me, like hiking part of the Appalachian Trail, like the biggest thing I got for it, like, like as cheesy it sounds, like it was just like good for my soul. Like I was alive, like felt yeah. very alive. And like, it was, um, I felt very recharged in that sense. Yeah. That's really interesting. I think one of the things that I brought it up was just how integral to everything we're saying, the idea of time is in our place in our perception of our lives and how much time we have mm. because generally you, you think of the the classic kind of if you ask a person who's at the end of their life what do you wish you spent more time doing and the classic thing that is said is it's never work i wish i worked more yeah right and so much of the cultural societal capitalistic narrative i think's primary goal is to obfuscate our perception of how much time we have here mm. because it needs you to not feel that you have a limited amount of time that you're wasting yeah because that's why i think it's taking time to think or having a, a mindfulness practice or anything that helps you to take a step back and reassess or therapy, what, whatever, um, you, you know, there's many methods to do that is so important because most of the time people go through day to day without thinking, hmm. well, so if I technically all have spent 60% of my life or more 60% of my life working, this job is that job worth 60% of my life. Right. Yeah. Is, do I want to be what we, and, and what is the reward for that? Right. So I, I think a lot of it comes from just living in this kind of, uh, just ongoing pattern where you don't think about it too much. And I think that's further enhanced by when, you, when unfortunately you're living in that type of pattern, you don't want to think about it because it feels mm. bad and it doesn't yeah. feel, it doesn't resonate with you and it makes you uncomfortable and makes you think maybe I should be living differently. 
right? Mm-hmm. And I was even thinking about that today. I was thinking about as as been just sitting editing MIDI notes, right? And mm-hmm. like technically, I'm doing what I love, right? What I want to do, but in the end, a lot of I I don't know how many hours a year I spend just editing MIDI data, mm-hmm. right? And I'm thinking like, is this how I and I just thought for a while I tried to kind of quantify in my head how many hours of my life am I spending editing notes that nobody cares about, mm. right? And getting them to be just a little bit better and that extra hour every day to get it a little bit better that nobody cares, right? Yeah. And when I try to assess it like that, it really shifts kind of priorities and it makes me wonder like, do I, is that worth? it's X percentage of my life, right? Yeah. What are the other alternatives, right? And it, it makes you take a step back. But that's an uncomfortable feeling to be like, oh, crap, let me let me reassess Repri- my life. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's a reprioritize. I mean, and what you mentioned too, you kind of hinted at this, which is something that he, uh, Stevenson talks about a little bit. I'm going to oversimplify it and then we can kind of dive in, but he, he kind of says like your, your work, your work as an individual, like really doesn't matter that much on the grand scheme of human history. And he even uses the, <laughs> he uses, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, I don't know, maybe even nihilistic, uh, attitude, but, I think part of the reason that he's bringing it up is to kind of like get people to do that reassessment of like, all right, this thing that you're obsessing about, obsessing about, like it it doesn't actually matter to the degree that you think it does. And he uses the example of Shakespeare and I, I'm having trouble. Let me me look for this actual quote. It's towards. Okay, here we go. He says, quote, suppose Shakespeare had been knocked on the head some dark night in Sir Thomas Lucy's preserves. The world have the world would have wagged on better or worse. The pitcher gone to the well, the scathe to the corn and the student to his book. And none would been any none one. No one been any the wiser of the loss. <laughs> so this was like, I don't know. This is a lot. He's just basically like saying suppose Shakespeare had died before he had created any of his work. Like the world would have gone on. Like nobody would have had any Ben, Benny, Ben, any worse off. Um, I don't know. I mean, he's, he's definitely, I think what he's doing here is he's kind of questioning this, this kind of great man theory to history, which for anybody who's not familiar is, is basically the idea that um, innovation and, these great steps forward in history are because there are these great individuals who come along and kind of, you know, move the gauntlet. He's kind of questioning that and saying like, you know, even if there wasn't a Shakespeare, there would have been another Shakespeare or, you know, even if there wasn't a Dar- a Darwin, there would have been a Alfred Russell Wallace who, you know, as we know, like was developing uh, almost, the same theory of natural selection the same time darwin was so i don't know i'm curious how you you took a lot of this because i think it can have the it can be liberating in a certain way of like all right i don't need to obsess about this thing i can kind of relax a bit but it can also have the kind of uh maybe depressive aspect of like nihilism of like well then what's the point of doing anything (laughs) yeah i mean on a personal I, th- I really like this section, whether it made me happy or not, I don't know. <laughs> but but I do agree, though, like mm. in, in some ways. I agree with it about coming from an artist about art, mm. for sure. I don't think most art artists the world would be worse without because there would be somebody else that would probably receive the same attention and mm. it would just be something different. I do think the one area I was able to think of that I disagree with him is, um, is that I do think timing matters. Yeah. So if there's some new, let's say somebody comes along and cures heart disease, mm. right? It matters if it's this year or next year. That's a yeah. lot of lives yeah. different. So I do think that matters 
So、mm. let's say we didn't have some innovators. I think if there is if that equals X number of people dying without this new innovation,、mm. I think it's just ridiculously nihilistic to say that doesn't matter. Yeah.、Um, Well, even think of something like I. What you just said made me think of like the Manhattan Project and、yeah. like、the atomic bomb. Just like timing definitely mattered in that equation of like, yeah, we would have gotten to the atomic bomb, but maybe the Germans would have gotten、yeah. there first. Or, <laughs>、exactly. You know. So, yeah, I mean, I I tend to think I, I tend to half agree with with Stevenson in that, like, yeah, I think. In the grand scheme of things, we probably would go around, but also, yeah, it's like, well, shit. If there weren't an Einstein, maybe we wouldn't have kind of discovered relativity for another decade or two, right? And you know, history would be very different than how it is. How many more people would have died of smallpox if the vaccine was delayed ten years? You、mm-hmm. know, it, it's it's yeah. I think those type of things matter, and that's why the, the one area that I have. An issue with what he says in in general is that I think there is an important element of certain work that just unequivocally makes the world better,、mm. right? It causes significantly less suffering, fewer people die, people are able to,、uh, people are allowed to live in the way he's saying. Yeah, man. There was one other. There was one other.、Um... Thing. So this is actually how he ends the piece. This is the very final paragraph.、Uh, he says, "Quote: The ends for which they give away their priceless youth, for all they know, man may be、uh, ch- chimerical or hurtful. The glory and riches they expect may never come, or may find them indifferent." So what he's saying here is. All of that work that you've done and traded your youth, your youth for, you know, the best years of your life for. In the final analysis, you might find three things. One, it might turn out, turn out that whatever you created is harmful to society, <laughs> or like just doesn't affect society at all. And he's also saying two. Uh, the glory you expect may never come, so you could, you know, work your ass off on this dream and it just never come. Or the third thing, he says, you may basically you may achieve this goal, but by the time you achieve it, find yourself indifferent. Just be like, oh, like, yeah, this is maybe something I wanted when I was twenty, but now that I've actually got it, I actually don't even care about it. So I think he's making the argument like this is why it is、uh, erroneous. Like this is why we shouldn't trade our youth for for work. I, is because we might get to the end, and one of these three things might happen. I definitely see. Like first of all, the last one he said is definitely、mm-hmm. the like for people that realize that and then continue doing it. Very much the like sunk cost fallacy.、Mm-hmm. Right. I've already spent this much time. I gotta go through with it.、Even、like you've if, already invested, you might as well keep investing. Exactly.、Yeah. Even when you know you're on a sinking ship, right?、Mm. And it's like, well, I already put that much time into this. Like, I'm 50. I don't want to just give that all up,、right? even though it's not what you want anymore. Yeah. yeah. And that you know、yeah. it, and and you're just like con- trying to every day convince yourself that no, this is what I want.、Mm. When it just it's clear that it's not.、Um, And then the second one, I feel like this is the glory you expect may never come. Yeah, yeah, and and I feel like this is something that is subconsciously rejected. Is you can actually, especially nowadays, find people that have gone a similar life path that you intend to, and ask them. How did it、mm. turn out? <laughs> yeah, you know. And again, like I going back to what we said before, I, I you need to have experience of your own to know for sure. But if you poll ten people that went into your line of work, let's say they all said, "Yeah, it was a waste of time." <laughs> yeah, you you might want to reconsider that. Yeah, but most of us don't do that,、mm. right? Most of us don't because I think part of us doesn't want to know. 
because yeah. we think that's a possibility and we don't want to, we're already in the sunk cost fallacy, even though it's mm. only been four years or let's say we started a new job. It's been four years, but anything it, we're already in that. And then next thing you know, it's 20 years in, right. And then mm. it's even the, that fallacy is even stronger and you just keep going and going and going and then you're done. And now you're this guy. <laughs> Yeah. It reminds me of the Jim Carrey had a quote and he said like, I wish everybody could be rich and famous so that they could see that it's not all it's cracked up to be. Yep. And a lot of people will be like, well, fuck you, man. Like I, (laughs) you know, I'm working two jobs over here. But like, I think what he's saying is like this pie in the sky is not actually a very delicious pie that we think it is. Um, and we were talking a little bit about this on the last podcast and like, like the Buddha, I think one of the things the Buddha had going for him was he was born extremely wealthy. He was born a prince. So, and he found himself dissatisfied. So he was at least in a place where he was like, Hey, I have the thing that all of these people are chasing and it's not that great. So I don't have any illusions about, you know, it's, it's not this mirage. Yeah. Cause I think he's, what he's saying is like a lot of people have this mirage of like, oh, if I just do this, this, and this, you know, then I'll, I don't know, retire on a tropical Island and everything will be great. Um, where the Buddha was on the tropical Island, you know, yeah. m- metaphorically and was like, you know, there's more to life than this. And, and it's so interesting that we reject those testimonials, right? Yeah. Like, cause we, we, I think you're yeah. right. We do kind of at some level want them to be true it's like yeah oh well no even though it wasn't true for jim carrey and the buddha like, right when i get my mill like i'll be i'll be set bro yeah and even yeah. though 90 percent of the celebrities say it sucks being famous no 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 yeah like no. when i'm famous yeah. <laughs> yeah but no it's gonna be different though for yeah. me because this or that or, or you know when i'm a rich person saying you know i'm still just as mm. miserable as i was when i was like middle class yeah it, it, no no that's ridiculous you know, they don't know. Yeah. What. It, it, there's so many, it amazes me how many ways we're able to just justify whatever we want to in the face of con- contradicting evidence. Yeah. And that is a really good, I think it's one of the, the things the people that like study like the science of happiness talk about as being like the most accurate way to like... <laughs> You know, if you want to have a good indicator of how happy you will be, like, when you get that job, find somebody that has a job and ask them, (laughs) like, uh, you know, um, yeah. There is another thing I was thinking of is I think that the strength of the belief is correlated to how upset you get when it's questioned. Mm. So I think very strong beliefs don't get as, um, don't get people as upset uh, when some people are overly oh. antagonistic. Right. Totally. Yeah. So I think that's maybe why that people are so sensitive about this topic in America. Mm. You can get somebody pissed off so quickly by talking about work or entitlements or anything like this, Hmm. because I think they deep down have an insecurity about the belief and they do subconsciously know there's something weird about it, right? This whole way they've lived their life, the system that they operate in, there's something screwy about it. But to admit that is too psychologically, um, uh, like unsettling to admit so they yeah. have to just keep justifying it. So when it's questioned, they just get very defensive and very upset. And like the old man here, lash right. out at the kid. Well, you need to get a job, kid, you know? And yeah. it, it, they don't go inward, they go outward. Right. The old man doesn't say, oh, maybe I should have spent more of my life like chilling by the stream. Yeah, or even He's before saying, that. no, you're doing it wrong. Or even yeah. before that, just asking what, what actually you're benefiting. Like being even just being inquisitive about it curious yeah 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 man well this uh this was this was great i i really enjoyed it and 
it took on a different form than I thought it would. Like I, I only, the only thing I knew from it was that quote about books, like books are a bloodless substitute for life. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was a, he was a wise guy and he, he, Stevenson, I was reading, he only lived to his mid forties. I died saw that pretty young. Yeah. And the other thing is interesting about him. Like he's a pretty, uh, pretty, um, what's the word? Like he, he produced quite a bit for somebody who is like all gung ho about, about idleness. Like he churned out some novels and some writing. So he was definitely, definitely getting it done. Like in between his travels and, you know, uh, cigar smoking sessions. I have a, a lot of respect for people who do the thing and then just say like, it was stupid. Like, don't even do it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. I'm killing it, but it doesn't matter. Whatever. He's like, I wrote treasure Island, like one of the like most iconic children's <laughs> books of all time. But if I would have just died before I wrote it, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. That's basically what he's saying. <laughs> and I'm happy yeah. for him that at least he per- portrays himself as somebody who lives in this way since he did only live to 40. Mm. And just as my last thing I would, I, that always puts it back in my perspective is the idea of front loading your life with the suffering to mm. receive at the back end the freedom right you might you be might, like stevenson yeah. you might die when you're in your mid 40s exactly it, that's, that's yeah. always a possibility so yeah i mean even more uh i guess that's even more <laughs> uh, argument for the things that he's talking about here is like yeah not only might you be too old and have bad knees to do that thing but like you could die and you know never get to take that trip or you know, do that thing that you, your soul wants to do. Um, yeah. Cool, man. Well, this was a lot of fun. We, we drank our, oh shit. I still have some in here. I thought I, <laughs> I thought I drank it all. We still got <laughs> nice some pizza out. rat. Yeah. I thought I was like, I couldn't have drunk two beers, but I thought this was empty. Well, that's a nice surprise. <laughs> <laughs> the glass is half full. As I say. <laughs> cool, man. Awesome, right. man. Good talking to you, buddy. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for listening to Unpacking Ideas. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with a friend or scroll down and write us a review or give us a rating. I know that all takes a bit of effort, but it really helps with the algorithm so that more people can discover the show. So thanks for doing that in advance. And if you would like to get in touch with me or to hear about what's coming up next on the podcast, please visit unpackingideas.com. And finally, if you are a gamer, definitely check out Alex's new app. Alex has been working on a new app in the App Store called Pocket Bard. And it's a music and sound companion app for tabletop gaming and RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. So if you're a gamer and you're interested in adding an interactive element to your gaming sessions, please check out Pocket Bard. All right, guys, that's it for today. And I will see you next episode.